Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Functional Count for 2022. Uh, we are at the talk by uh, John uh, Azaria about uh, nature-inspired optimization algorithms. So John, uh, thank you so much for uh, joining us and uh, I'm handing over the mic to you. Thanks very much. Um, it's a pleasure to uh, be in a functional conference. I've been in a, in a specifically functional conference for some time now. Um, and over the last couple of years, I've been fooling around with uh, some writing some optimization algorithms. And I thought, well, this would be a good time to actually share some of the learnings that I've had um, in terms of um, implementing nation inspired optimization code in F -sharp and Rust. So my name is John Azrai, I'm the, I'm the principal architect at, at, uh, at Microsoft. I work on the Azure Kubernetes team. I used to work with these fine people uh, up at the Microsoft Quantum team where I was one of the people who built the first version of QSharp, programming language for quantum computers. I want to acknowledge Dr. Helmut Katzgraber specifically for giving me a lot of mentorship and helping me along in trying to build out um, my skills in the optimization space. There's a disclaimer that this is not an official Microsoft talk. Um, so for actual official Microsoft quantum material, um, you will need to contact the Microsoft quantum team. All right. So we have a lot of material to cover today. I just want to walk through the agenda a little bit and then sort of get moving. I'm happy to take your questions at the end. So if you please put your questions in there, I'll be happy to like, address each of them as we go along. Um, so let's start by talking a little bit about the current state of classical computing. Um, what are the big problems we have and why we can't actually solve them? A little bit of an introduction to quantum computing and then segueing into quantum uh, optimization and optimization in general. And we'll, we'll wrap up with showing some code and talking about magnets and uh, long walks, All right? So in terms of classical computing, 48 years, we have seen the trend, uh, it's very clear about how machines have actually um, evolved over time. We have a lot of transistors on chips and the transistors are really, really small now, but the clock speeds have plateaued for 20 years. This is reality. This is fundamentally because we are hitting the limits of physics at this point. For example, this trend, the orange trend that you see in terms of the number of transistors on the chip, you can't make the chips any bigger. You can't make the transistors any smaller because we are now reaching the point where transistors are literally toggled on by one electron. And you can't remove the heat fast enough. So this trend, while it's been held for a long time in terms of Moore's law, um, will actually plateau off. So you've seen the typical power plateauing off because of the heat condition, the typical frequency plateauing off, single thread performance plateauing off, and eventually, number of transistors per chip will also plateau off. So we've reached, uh, in some sense, a dead end and we need to make some, we need to do something to improve further. Now, a reasonable question to ask is why bother, right? Like we solved all the big problems, you know, why do we need to even look at bigger and faster machines? And the reality is that there are some problems that we can't really solve. For example, when we want to do drug discovery or carbon capture, any of the sort of emerging technologies that are needed, anytime we want to simulate a natural process, it turns out that classical computing actually doesn't scale up well enough. So for example, let's look at hydrogen, which is a single electron um, system. And just to map the states out of that single electron requires us to know quite a bit about its quantum state. Now, as you add electrons to a molecule, every electron that you add doubles the space required. And we hit a very hard limit very fast in that when you want to simulate a thousand electron system like a reasonably sized um, molecule, um, you don't have space, right? Because there are only two to the 400 and something atoms in the universe, 
and you need to store at least for a thousand electron systems to in the order of two to the thousand coefficients for the calculation. So we don't have space, we just run out of space in the universe to be able to do this classic thing. And that's a reality. So we're going to hit, hit that very fast if you want to solve any problem relating to molecule simulation. Similarly, this cryptography, I mean, this is a 2048 bit system. To, to factorize that number is necessarily hard. In fact, we depend on the fact that getting the two uh, individual uh, uh, factors of that uh, subprime to actually work properly, the semi prime to work properly. Now, uh, if you wanted to look at a 1024 bit number, which is half the length of that thing, uh, you need half a million core years to factor. You need this complexity because we depend on it. And if you want to now build systems that actually need to uh, either defeat the cryptography or get better systems, then you need, you need systems where uh, the just doing the math is more difficult than you can do classically. Another um, common class of problems are the incomplete problems. Now, these are provably non polynomial type problems. They turn out to be profoundly useful for industry. Like you would have all come across Tarnan Salesman or 3SAT or the integer knapsack or a couple of others which I might introduce you to today. It turns out that all NP complete problems are equivalent for some reasonable meaning of the word equivalent. They can all in polynomial time be um, transformed into each other. So solving one problem effectively gives you within polynomial time transformation solution to any other problem. But by definition, these are not solvable in polynomial time and you can prove them. They're provably not solvable. So they're very, very difficult problems. Unfortunately, we are really, really dependent on those problems for any number of real world um, solutions. Like anytime you want to send a box to Amazon or uh, you want to optimally pack a ship or you want to route a packet across from one place to another, you run into the limits of, of the applications of these solutions. So it's a very vital importance for us to be able to solve NP complete problems. And let's uh, quickly take a look and see how quantum computing has um, some impact on any of, of these problems. So in a nutshell, and I'm going to really rush over this because there is a wealth of information out there. You know, we have some basic quantum computing concepts the key takeaway in this game is that solving a problem twice as big only requires one additional qubit. So if you just add an extra qubit, you can solve a problem twice as big. And you can easily do the simulation piece for molecules by mapping qubits to electrons. We have well-known, well-researched mathematical transforms to do this kind of thing. So this is fairly straightforward as long as you have enough qubits. Similarly, we are also have a provably fast exponential speed up for integer factorization. This is the one sort of like core algorithm that everybody knows, the Shor's algorithm, which basically proves that you can, in uh, polynomial time, actually um, factorize an integer. So this, this vastly improves the amount of time it takes to actually do integer factorization. However, the state of the art in quantum computing isn't um, very happy at the moment. Right? Quantum hardware is still in its infancy. We're still researching what kind of qubits we can build and what those characteristics are. The current qubits that we have are effectively extremely noisy. And what that means is that they only hold their, um, their value for a very short period of time. And they're also incredibly susceptible to, um, to interference by the environment. And trying to build a logical qubit, which can actually do a computation for a significant period of time um, is still a challenge. It's an engineering challenge that's out there at the moment. So we don't have any other correct logical qubits at this point. So if you want to really be brutal about it, depending on the technology that you use to build the physical qubit, you need between one and 10,000 physical qubits to create one logical qubit. And because we only have at the order of a few dozen physical qubits at this point, 
you can safely say that we don't even have one logical cube. Mask manufacturing is not possible. Engineering wise, there are a lot of change challenges involved because you have to work with really exotic environments like super low temperatures um, and very, very fine tolerances for the, the material that you build. So the engineering challenges involved in actually building out qubits is not at the state of what you might call maturity. Similarly, on the software side, you know, everything's ad hoc, different programming devices have different programming interfaces and a support of different programming languages and libraries and different mechanisms for actually interfacing with them. So there are no industry standards at this point. Even though I was actively involved in building the first language for programming, a quantum computer, um, we aren't the only one. Our language at the time anyway was still relatively rudimentary. There's a lot of scope for improvement in terms of code optimization, type theory, and, and so on. And all of that is very primitive. Uh, this thing is interesting because you might expect that after a few decades of people working on quantum uh, algorithms, that we would have a whole slew of algorithms that we could basically employ. And that's not the case at all. Literally, the, the entire canon of, of uh, algorithms that we know of that use quantum mechanical um, phenomena to do quantum computing uh, fit on one web page. And in fact, that web page is maintained by Dr. Stephen Jordan who I acknowledge very on in the game. So we are still struggling very hard to find new algorithms to do so. I think charitably we can say that we are hampered by the fact that there is no hardware or no computer that actually support the development of new algorithms. So it's entirely possible that we'll have new algorithms for programming quantum devices, but it's possible that the inventors of those um, algorithms are in kindergarten at this point. And we, we need, we owe it to them to give them as much of a, a head start in terms of um, hardware and, and infrastructure so that they can actually come up with new algorithms. But the reality is at the moment, we have a very small uh, number of algorithms. We may have demonstrated actually that quantum computing is real and has a significant advantage over classical computing. But that comes with a caveat that the proof was not actually some real world use case. It's a very contrived engineered question that was asked so that the answer would come back with, yes, this is faster with quantum uh, hardware than it is with classical hardware. We covered this already. <clears throat> and now about the hard problems. What about the NP complete stuff? Now we can solve, uh, as I mentioned, the, the the molecule simulation problem, which is a canonical classical, I mean, quantum computing problem. And in order to do that, um, we need a lot more qubits than we have. We need between 1,000 and 10,000 logical qubits to solve anything that's appreciably useful. We would like to solve a whole bunch of really interesting problems that surround things like carbon capture and fertilization, fertilizer manufacture, nitrogen capture, and so on which we cannot do classically because uh, the molecules involved are uh, large and complex. So we can estimate that if we have a thousand logical qubits, we can get started to doing something useful. In terms of the integer factorization, well, we've made some progress there. We can successfully factor 35 into 7 and 5 um, on quantum hardware. Um, and uh, we occasionally get the right answers as, as is common in statistical uh, computing, uh, but you need 4,000 logical qubits to crack 2048 at least. So we are some way from, from this, uh, we can safely say at this point. And in terms of the NP completeness, let's introduce the Savin Salesman problem. Now, this guy is a well known problem. It's very easy to state. Given a bunch of cities, find the fastest way that a traveling salesman can get all those cities and come back to where they started. Um, by by meaning the word fast as being either the shortest possible time or the shortest possible distance or some other metric, right? And depending on how you lay the problem out, it turns out that finding out even if you got the best solution is actually quite hard. So once you get beyond a bunch of 50 or 60 cities, we start hitting uh, 
some really, really hard limits. Like this particular problem scales worse than exponentially, but it's profoundly useful, as we said. And the kicker is that there is no quantum known, there's no known quantum algorithm that can claim to solve NP complete problems any better than class two machines. That is to say, you don't get a quantum advantage to go uh, on an NP complete problem. Um, and this is very important because. I mean, the, we don't know what NP, what the relationship between NP and P is. That's still an open question. But any claim that you have a quantum algorithm that sort of defeats NP completeness is viewed with uh, extreme suspicion. And then it, it usually turns out to be for good reason because there's still no known quantum algorithm that has actually been successfully shown to be any better at solving NP complete problems than classical ones. Uh, so let's come to the meat of this talk. And uh, I, you know, I want to spend the next 20 minutes or so actually walking through some, some real uh, interesting problems where we actually talk about those entry complete type uh, problems and how to use, how to write some code and how to use F sharp and um, you know, other functional languages to actually um, solve these problems. So I want to introduce you to the Ising model. Right. The Ising model, uh, you know, I just saw a schematic of um, to the Ising, Ising problem. Um, the Ising model is a very good approximation of what how magnetism works, right? So if you think of each of these arrows as representing some form of an electron spin around something, then depending on whether this spin is clockwise or not, you will find dipole moments that basically um, interact with the electrons next to it. So um, by basically um, trying to induce order into the system, all the spins will try to flip in such a way that the system reaches a ground state. So in this particular case, we have very clear rules about what the interaction patterns between each cell and its neighbors is. And uh, we've, we basically define that the lowest energy state is when all the spins are aligned. And then we try to find a, a way to solve that problem. Now, the classical way of solving this is to basically um, use a mechanism like, um, it's a kind of a Monte Carlo type system where you start with a random um, setup and then you check to see when you flip an electron, whether it actually lowers the ground state of the system. And if it does, then you accept it. And if it doesn't, then probabilistically you accept it if the temperature of the system is high enough to, 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 to allow you to jump over local minima. And when you do this kind of simulated annealing type approach, you can then cool the temperature down little by little to actually come up with a ground state solution that's very quick, uh, that, that actually represents the solution to the problem. Now, in the case of ferromagnets and two dimensions, code is actually very, very straightforward. So it's a really, it's a demoing piece of code. I'm gonna just show you what that looks like. So this, this code is written in F-sharp. A few interesting things to point out about it is the fact that we use units of measure to keep our numbers different. I mean, I have floats, some of which represent energy, some of which represent temperatures. I want to make sure that I don't add temperature and energy together to give us some nonsense. So in this particular case, as I mentioned, we create the, the matrix that says, well, my energy between myself and my neighbor is lowest when both our spins are aligned. And we represent that by saying that the coordinate, the difference, I mean, the, the coefficient between the two nodes in this graph or in this lattice um, basically is one when I'm a neighbor and zero when I'm not. And this is in effect um, uh, the statement of the problem. Now, it turns out that if you create a checkerboard type pattern, not when it's all constantly one, this turns out to represent a ferromagnetic model. 
if it's a checkerboard pattern, then the energy is lowest when every spin is anti-aligned with the spacebar, and that is called an antiferromagnet. And here's the difficult bit. When these coefficients start getting to be random numbers between zero and, and one, uh, that is to say arbitrary numbers between zero and one, you have an energy landscape that's no longer just a simple step where you have high energy and then it sort of uh, becomes a ground state very quickly. You land up with a very complex energy landscape with many hills and valleys. And trying to find the ground state of that problem is NP complete. And that is called an Ising spin glass. So you can use the same prob program that I've written here to solve the spin glass by just providing the appropriate mapping matrix to it. But if you notice very clearly uh, here, you know, the computation of the, the interaction energy and the, and the computation of the solution of the thing is literally 125 lines of code. It's very, very terse. It is type safe in that you can actually see, I don't know if you can actually see this, I've zoomed, uh, I've zoomed everything in, but you can see that the units of the beta delta e is actually uh, energy per uh, degree Kelvin, which, which is exactly what you want when you want to actually do this. So we have, we have the ability to, to keep type safe and measure safe while doing this computation. And if we run this program, we can actually see that we come up with a ground state that works. So in this particular case, the ground state that we have <clears throat> is actually an island. So we weren't able to relax the ground state any further. All of these spins are in one direction, all of these spins are another, but it went from this chaotic set of spins to that chaotic set of spins after 50,000 iterations at 0.9 Kelvin. And you can see that the performance is actually relatively good. We did this uh, with a 20 by 20 matrix in about 250 milliseconds. So this is, uh, let's just go back and take a look at what made this code cool about it. So one of the first things that I mentioned earlier is the fact that the whole Metropolis algorithm, which is over here is under 50 lines long, and it actually matches the mathematical description of what we are trying to do, as in compute the before energy, compute the after, compute the delta and the, in the energy. And if, if the energy has reduced, then accept it. If not, then decide whether you want to accept it and then go ahead and um, flip the spin and try to see if that gets you into a better state. Now, this algorithm was actually published in a paper and the code here is actually very close to the kind of pseudocode that was published in the paper. And we, we got that because of the expressive and um, terse uh, method of programming that, that f -sharp gives us. So units of measure basically gives us safety. So like I said, we have two, variant, two types of floats here. One is going to represent temperature, the other one represents energy. And we're going to constantly keep adding things in terms of energy, but we don't want to be able to um, make the mistake of adding a, a temperature and an energy together. And we're able to do that. Now, if you notice that we now annotate the energies appropriately and the types interaction energy returns to us the type which is a representative of the energy as we expect. And so this gives us confidence in being able to reason about the code. Similarly, as I mentioned, even when you do computations based on these units of measure, we get reasonable results in terms of, um, in terms of, of what, what the expression uh, represents. Again, as I mentioned to you, this algorithm, which is the, the entire Monte Carlo system, turns out to be very, very close to the to the expression of the algorithm in the mathematics paper. So when somebody wants to check or reason about the correctness of your code and they have a reference of the paper, does this code represent what the paper represents? Well, we're able to, to, to do that in a relatively easy fashion because of the expressive nature of the language. So in summary, 
we've used uh, mutation judiciously, so this isn't like a pure functional system, but we've used the uh, we've used the benefits of the language to give us the performance that we need, the the clarity that we need, um, the expressivity that we need. Uh, however, we do have a system uh, limitation in that it would have been nice to be able to say, well, in this situation, I would like the um, I would like the system to be dependently typed, and we create an Ising model that is based on the size of the matrix that we want. And there's no way to parameterize that given our type system. Um, in, indeed, there is a Rust implementation which I wrote, which does this parameterization because they allow us to do that. And uh, also, compiling down the native with Rust gives us an implementation that's two times as fast as, uh, as F sharp. But two times as fast is actually not as um, profoundly important. Um, I, it, it, 20 times as much would have been like, you know, uh, an indictment on the, the lack of performance on, on, on the F-sharp side of things. Uh, but writing completely type safe managed code to be able to, to get reasonably fast solutions um, turns out to be possible with F-sharp. Now let's come back to the traffic salesman problem, right? As I mentioned, the problem is easy to state. In 50 cities, you have a graph, you have weights between each of the cities, and now you find, tell me to uh, find me the Hamiltonian cycle that has the lowest weight. And it turns out that this problem is super well studied. There's uh, a lot of canonical problem sets that you can go in and I'll take you all to the page at some point and show you what that looks like. And there's lots of problem variations as well. So if you want to get started taking a crack on the traveling salesman problem, yeah, um, rather than look at leap code, which um, may sort of emphasize the fact that you want to go with some kind of dynamic programming sort of model, which actually will not scale at all, um, to solve a real problem and get some real data sets, you can actually go into this area and start looking for some problems to solve. And indeed, that's what I did. So I'm going to take a look at the code again. And we're going to use a genetic algorithm in order to be able to solve it. So we'll come back to the algorithm in a minute. But the first part of the problem that I want to show you is the fact that we have in, in, the, um, in the problem specification, there is an eight or nine page document that tells us how the problem specification is laid out. What is the format of your data input? And it turns out that when you look at that, functional programmers have a very different way of, of approaching a problem like that. When we see a problem like that, we think DSL. We think that there's a domain specific language. You're trying in halting terms to tell me what the grammar of this language is by giving me a written document. Well, I can do better. I have a type system that I can actually represent stuff with. And so I can basically say, look, you know, here are all the things that I want. I'm going to have a string, a comment, dimension, a problem type can be one of those things. A node better be a number. It's based on zero. And I might want to consider a one-based system, or it may be based on one, and I want to consider a zero-based system, right? And then there's 2D coordinates, there's 3D coordinates, there's edges, and there's doors and weights, and so on and so forth. Everything that you told me in eight pages of text, I have now put into 120 lines of code. And now I have an expressive way to reason about your language and be able to say, look, when I see a, uh, a line in your data file, I can parse it into something that I can actually operate on. In fact, I can build out a complete weighted graph based on the kind of problem that you gave me. And I can compute for a complete weighted graph. I can compute a given to a length. So if you give me a tour, I can go down with that graph and compute the weight and tell you how, how long it takes to, to make that trip. Well, that's, turning, that's going to turn out to be something super useful. And uh, we need to basically, um, we need to set ourselves up for success. And the first bit in there is actually about um, understanding how to drop the data. And so then you can write a puzzle. So here, Again, I've taken the expressions that were outlined in the code and built out 
a puzzle that would actually build a structure that allowed me to traverse a given data input as if it was a data structure that I could play with. And this code is actually quite terse. So if you look at the first 300 lines or so of the problem, it's really just the creation of the weighted graph. And you have a parser that basically has all the parse functions, and that's literally another 150 lines of code. And most of what that code um, is, is actually diagnostic information that allows me to go back and look at what kind of um, data is being parsed and how I got the information that I got so that I can and test how everything works. So it's actually very simple to think about a problem with a parser. If you have the, uh, the parser as one of your, or parser combinator library as one of the, the tools in your toolkit that you can play with. So uh, as an FP person, uh, having the ability to map the domain into a type system, I mean, a type library, and then having the ability to quickly come up with a parser um, to, to crop the data files basically gives us an enormous amount of power in order to be able to, to run with, with um, the code. So let's go back and take a look at the genetic algorithm now for, for building out a solution to this, um, um, to the Travis case problem. So if you think of a graph with n nodes in there, and then you think of some random, random number, random ordering of the numbers between one and n, that random number, that random ordering will basically represent a walk through the graph. It may not represent the most efficient walk through the graph, but if you start with a given point and end at the same point, then you've created a Hamiltonian cycle. Say you've got five nodes and your um, random number generator gave you a sequence that looked like five, three, two, one, four. Well, that means that that represents a tour that goes to the fifth city first, the second city next, the, 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 the third city next, the second city after that, the first city after that, and then the fourth city after that. And then we'll come back to the first, uh, the fifth city, right? So all we need to do is to represent um, a, a tour is to basically have an array with an ordering of nodes, uh, ordering of numbers between one and n, right? So given that, you can basically start working on a genetic algorithm. And this is what a genetic algorithm looks like. So in our system, what we'll do is we'll create a population of random solutions. Each of these random solutions is that random, random ordering of nodes, as I, as I mentioned earlier. And we'll rank them according to the weights because once you have a random solution, then we can um, go through and compute how long it takes to go down that tour. And we'll find the best tours and put them at the top of the list. Then we'll take this population and divide it into two bits somewhere and we'll say, okay, this bit of the population is the elite population and the other ones are not so elite. And what we'll do is we'll pick a parent from each of the groups and start trying to create a child from that. And we'll do that by trying to take as much of, um, we'll create the gene for each of the, um, the children from either the, the, the elite parent or the plebeian parent, and we'll bias towards picking more of the genes from the elite parent. That's the biased key piece. Then we'll recode the child's genes to get its ordering, the ordering that it represents, compute its fitness. And then we'll create a new generation where we keep the, all the elites from this generation. A large number of children that we've now generated, which presumably are going to be better. And then to break out of uh, any sort of local minima that we get, we'll introduce some fresh blood in terms of adding some new random candidates in there to try and see if they can actually maybe randomly become better than or form part of the next generation's elite. Now you, you can repeat this evolution cycle many times and you can come up with a solution. Now notice when you do this, you're not actually solving anything specifically about the traveling salesman problem. The, the, 
the constraints of the problem are embedded into the encoding of the problem. But the actual solution isn't like a dynamic programming one where you go off and try to find, oh, is this better? Is this whole chain better than the previous chain? No, throw back, go and backtrack one and do something better and so on and so forth. You don't have to do any of that. Here, you're actually letting the system evolve towards a better solution stochastically. And so in order to do that, we can actually take a look at the code. As I told you, you know, there's uh, the parsing was an advantage. And now let's take a look at the genetic algorithm that we have. So in this situation, again, the description that I told you about how to actually create a population is actually all in this 30 lines of code. It's literally right here, right? So get, get the members of this population, get the elites, pick a random elite, Pick, uh, get some random children, get some random mutants. Uh, this, is, this is basically um, introducing the new population. And here, what we do is do a parameterized uniform crossover with a bias towards the elite parent. And you pick the elite parent and the other parent, and you, you go off and you create this child. Now, we take advantage of the fact that once, a, once um, a solution is built, it is completely immutable. So the problem represents, uh, is represented in terms of immutable components. So parallelization literally falls out of the mix. So we just go from map crossover to array parallel map crossover, which basically allows us to do the, the building of the next generation in parallel. Similarly, it is possible because the elites are always going to be pulled into the, the mix and the mutants uh, will be somewhat random as well. And the children are gonna come back with a, with the fitness and a, um, you know, we compute the fitness only once because again, the chromosome doesn't change. So because we do that, we're able to basically replace the sort by a three-way merge. And in fact, this will improve performance even further by reducing it from the n log n type um, limit to just literally being linear. You swap things in until you get uh, the new elite population, which is the only thing you care about. And then after that, you basically just make sure that they're unsorted and it doesn't really matter. So effectively, by looking at the problem and taking advantage of, the, of its immutability we are immediately able to write very clean code, but that's also leveraging the problem's properties to be um, super performant from that perspective. So in this particular case, um, we are able to actually run and show that this works. So again, the FP advantage is effectively going to take advantage of the fact that the properties of the problem come with immutability. The properties of the problem have immutability built into them. And therefore, we can take advantage of that and take advantage of parallelism and the fact that you can actually um, compute, uh, you know, limit the computation to one, uh, one time and be able to also reduce the amount of sorting required because you can take advantage of the fact that uh, a linear merge will actually be faster than a, um, a an n log n type of sort. See. So, as I mentioned, um, this is again another example where the pro the code that is actually written uh, follows very closely with the specification written in the paper. The entire evolution of the code is laid to only thirty lines long, and it exploits the parallelism that comes inherently with the problem. So as I said, the summary for this problem is that this is a showcase of using parses, DSLs, and making that a part of your toolkit, and then using immutability as part of the solution when it offers itself as a part of the problem, and try to keep the code um, as terse and readable. The code is actually still fast. I can give you a quick demo. So for example, um, let me run this code. 
and it's going to basically um, Demo girls are not happy today. Yes, that's more like it. Yeah, so we actually had traffic salesman problem. We ran over it 5,000 times. We kept the elite population to 25%, added 15% mutants in there, and picked 75% of the elite parents' chromosomes as opposed to 50. We started with a population count of 96, and we had an initial random fitness of 102,000 and the final fitness of 27,000. So we actually converged fairly fast. In fact, if we want to see what that looks like, we can take a look at the graph that got written out. And let's, uh, let's quickly graph this. And should give you a sense of how just by reinforce, reinforcing uh, good characteristics of a solution over others, you come up with uh, a solution that actually lands up converging fairly quickly. As you can see here, we started at around about 100,000 and we basically came down to about 25, 30,000 fairly quickly, exponentially uh, fast, in fact. Um, here you'll also be able to tell that the code, we didn't pay for the expressivity by, um, by, by, by writing of bad performance. And that's the conclusion I had. So the key points that we have, we went through a fair bit of material here. We approaching limits of Moore's law, you know, we have some quantum computing advantages for some problems that classical computing can't solve. We are, where we are in the quantum computing stage is that we're not all that far ahead in terms of being able to solve real world problems. The hard problems continue to stay insoluble at this point. Optimization stays hard. And as of entry complete problems are equivalent, we, we evolved uh, solutions for two NP complete problems, the Ising spin glass and the, the Hamiltonian cycle TSP. And we used two nature inspired approaches for solving these using, using uh, FP and leveraging the benefits of the language uh, in order to do so. So that's my talk. Um, uh, here are some links I will post these later, or you can come and ask me for this. This information is available on GitHub. If you follow me on GitHub, you'll find the nature, nature inspired optimization repo there. And um, I think we're out of time. We have maybe one minute for time for questions, but I will actually pop over to the, um, to the table and hang out for a bit after. Thank you very much. Thanks, John. Uh, thanks a lot for your talk.